So I think we're all aware that Richter's transformation is obviously the development of a more aggressive lymphoma in the context of CLL. And the vast majority of these are typically a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which a very important distinction among those is whether they're clonally related to the underlying CLL, which is the case in the majority, perhaps 75 to 90 percent, versus clonally unrelated, and therefore more perhaps like a de novo diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with a better prognosis. Hodgkin's lymphoma is seen in several percent with two different pathologic types, Reed-Sternberg cells within a CLL background in type 1, or type 2, more like a de novo Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then, of course, there are other rare lymphomas, including plasmablastic lymphoma. So estimates of the incidence of Richter syndrome have varied widely historically from 1 to 11 percent. Recent data from FC-based chemoimmunotherapy trials from the Germans or MD Anderson have suggested a 5 to 8 percent rate of Richter's at 5 to 12 year follow-up. Of course, that's in the setting of treatment where we do believe Richter syndrome is more frequent. In terms of outcome, there are a couple prognostic scores out there. This one from Mayo based on clinical features alone. And you can see that it's difficult to define a group with a reasonable long-term survival, unfortunately. Davida Rossi came up with a three-item score which does actually define a group with a better outcome. These are patients with a good performance status without P53 disruption and who achieve complete remission. Now, of course, achieving complete remission is often the big problem in this disease. We do get initial responses, but even if they're complete, the patients tend to progress quite rapidly. One of the features that may be associated with whether or not we get a complete remission is, again, whether the Richter syndrome is clonally related to the underlying CLL or not. Now, clonally related Richter's has a much higher incidence of TP53 disruption, which we've already heard from Rick how adverse that can be, and also a higher incidence of stereotyped V genes. And just to remind you, stereotypy of the immunoglobulin gene occurs in about a third of CLL patients. And essentially, it refers to a situation where a small subset of patients with CLL have a virtually identical B cell receptor gene, which is vanishingly unlikely by chance suggesting possible clonal selection of that subset. And then on the right, you can see that these clonally related Richters have the very poor prognosis we associate with Richters, whereas the unrelated patients are doing better, again, perhaps more like a de novo diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So you've already seen this slide today, summarizing a variety of risk factors for Richters. There have been a few germline polymorphisms associated with Richters. I would say that they're all provisional and haven't been extensively valued validated. Prior CLL therapy is associated with a higher risk of Richter's. Clinical factors such as more advanced disease or bulky adenopathy, although these may really be a proxy for the biological characteristics of the CLL, where we know that unmutated IGVH, the higher risk IGVH, is higher risk for Richter's. The stereotype B cell receptors, as I mentioned. And then features that suggest more cellular activation, such as higher expression of CD38, CD49D, and ZAP70. The somatic genetic events listed here provide a basic biologic framework for thinking about some of the genetic abnormalities in Richter's. So about half of them have P53 disruption, which may often have been present in the preexisting CLL. And then often associated with that is CMYC activation. You already heard that preexisting CMYC in the CLL is associated with Richter's. And then CDKN2A deletion is often associated with this subgroup. And then about a third have trisomy 12 commonly with notch 1 mutation, which you've also already heard is associated with Richter's. The others are less clear. So this slide just illustrates that Richter's is its own entity. It is not genetically similar to either ABC type DLBCL shown in the red or GCB type DLBCL shown in the blue. Richter's is in black. And you can see that the distribution of genetic abnormalities is very different in Richter's from either of those subtypes of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, we've already alluded to the increased risk of Richter's with notch mutation. And you can see here that increased risk from one of several studies. And Rick also mentioned the association of notch mutation with using the immunoglobulin 4-39 gene, in particular if you have the, a stereotyped 4-39 gene, which about half the patients with 4-39 will. 
And so you can see the combination of both of those, notch mutation with 4-39, is associated with an extremely high cumulative probability of Richter's. And then notch 1 without 4-39 is intermediate. And 4-39 by itself, not as adverse. So how do we diagnose Richter's? I think we all know this. But the central role of PET scan has really become clear in the last few years that I think most of us with a clinical suspicion of Richter's will definitely get a PET scan to do a targeted biopsy at the region that's hottest on PET scan because often there's coexistent CLL. And then ideally, this is, of course, an excisional biopsy. If you identify diffuse large B cell lymphoma, historically we've treated that with diffuse large B cell lymphoma regimens, which we'll talk about more. Oftentimes you'll actually find just CLL, but it's often clinically aggressive CLL with or without p53 mutation. And so I generally treat all of these as CLL, but as high risk CLL. Hodgkin's lymphoma we treat as Hodgkin's lymphoma, similarly with alternate diagnoses. So in the chemoimmunotherapy era, as we've already seen, overall survival with Richter's has been quite poor. And the main point I wanted to make on this slide is that a couple of series shown here at the bottom, again, illustrate that patients who've not had any prior therapy for their CLL do have a better chance of survival in the event of Richter's. And this may be a proxy for clonally unrelated CLL. But these patients can do well with diffuse large B cell lymphoma type therapy. So we've already seen these slides from Rick, but this is what about Richter's in the novel agent era? Has it changed? Is it different from what we've seen after chemoimmunotherapy? So these are Gen Yox data, 10% cumulative incidence of transformation at four years, very poor survival still in the red curve, risk factors including complex karyotype and MYC abnormality. And they've also reported that near tetraploid karyotype is particularly high risk for Richter's as shown here. And what about venetoclax? So in some of the early data from venetoclax in this study from the Australians, in patients who were very heavily pretreated prior to venetoclax, there's quite a high incidence of Richter's, as shown here, several cases of Hodgkin's and predominantly diffuse large B-cell lymphoma Richter's in this group of relapsers compared to progressive CLL. And survival, as expected, was poor. This is improved with less heavily pretreated patients, of course. And as a result of this, an informative study was done in the trial of venetoclax in patients who'd progressed on kinase inhibitors using PET scans to screen the patients prior to the trial for pre-existing Richter's. And so core biopsies were required in the event of an SUV greater than 10 or an SUV max of 4 to 10 with B symptoms, large nodes, or LDH. And so 57 of 167 patients, about a third, met the criteria for a biopsy. And of the ones who underwent biopsy, about a quarter had DLBCL, and 6% had other malignancies. So even though the majority of patients still had CLL, it was clearly important to biopsy these patients. But at the same time, there was no absolute cutoff that clearly told us that patients would have Richter's. My colleague Matt Davids, along with Jennifer Wyax, spearheaded an effort to pull together data on Richter's in the novel agent era from nine academic centers. And they had 71 patients with a median age of 55, median of three prior therapies, so heavily pretreated. 49% had 17P, 75% had complex karyotype. So, again, key risk factors. Not much data was available on somatic mutations, but of the patients tested, there was a, quite a high incidence of P53 notch and SF3B1. And all the 10 patients who were tested for clonal relationship were clonally related to the underlying CLL. Median time from novel agent to Richter's was nine months, consistent with the earlier data. And most of the patients had had a prior BTK inhibitor, 83%. 87% had a diffuse large B cell lymphoma transformation. Again, unmutated IGVH, and particularly enriched families were 1-69, which is very common amongst the unmutated group, and 4-39, as we've already seen. Now, unfortunately, a panoply of therapies were used, and the overall response rate was quite poor at about 40%, with a CR rate of only 15%. Median survival was only three months. But none of the seven patients who actually achieved CR had died in a follow-up of 11 months, again, underscoring the importance of achieving CR, but also we know the difficulty of it. And there was no apparent difference in overall survival based on which novel agent you developed your Richter's transformation on, although 
limited data for either the BCL2 or PI3 kinase inhibitor in this data set. So from this large series of patients developing Richter's and novel agents, we see that they generally had high risk underlying CLL disease biology. Most likely the Richter's occurred within a year. There's substantial variation amongst treatments and outcomes remain very poor if you don't achieve CR, which is unfortunately the great majority of patients. So we really need novel treatment strategies. So what's under investigation? So venetoclax has some efficacy in Richter syndrome, three out of seven responses in this paper by my colleague Matt Davids. And then retrospective data from Ohio State demonstrated a potential plateau on the survival curve with our epoch for Richter's at about 20 percent. And so based on these data, Matt proposed venetoclax with our epoch in Richter's as a trial that we initiated our institution and a number of other institutions have joined. And you can see the schema was to start with our epoch for one cycle and then do an accelerated ramp up of venetoclax prior to the second cycle basically a daily escalation of the dose. And then venetoclax at 400 milligrams was given on days one to 10 through up to six cycles of therapy, of combined therapy. There was potential for venetoclax maintenance after. And so he presented these data at Lugano in June, at which point 26 patients had received at least one dose of study treatment with a median age of 63 for the patients. Again, high incidence of 17P and P53 mutation as well as complex karyotype. Median prior CLL treatments was two. And many patients had had prior novel agents. The CR rate was 67% amongst the 18 patients, which is really quite encouraging. Furthermore, five of nine patients eligible for allotransplant were able to proceed to transplant, with four of them still in CR at various follow-up after allo. Seven patients did die, four from progressive disease prior to VEN, and then a couple of treatment-related complications potentially. The trial's fully accrued, and we're looking to do a second cohort, which Matt is currently deciding how that will be formulated. But overall, for a young, fit patient, these data looked pretty encouraging. So median follow-up is three months at this point, with a median PFS of 10 months, and overall survival of 16 months. So that's venetoclax and venetoclax with EPOC. What about abrutinib? So we have various case series, case reports, which suggest high response rates but durability is quite limited. Patients relapse quite quickly, which again is often the problem. Checkpoint inhibitors have come to the fore as a very interesting class of drugs for Richter's, even though there's been very limited activity seen in CLL itself. And so this was an initial report on pembrolizumab from the Mayo Clinic, where four out of nine patients with Richter's, shown in the upper left, had a response to pembrolizumab. Durability on the lower left is not as great as usual, but there are several patients who have ongoing remissions. Of note is the fact that most of the patients who responded had transformed on prior abrutinib. There was some correlation of expression of PD-1 and PD-L1 in the tissue with response to pembrolizumab in this study. Another study from the MD Anderson from Nitin Jane looked at nivolumab with abrutinib in two different cohorts. I'm just going to discuss the Richter's cohort briefly. Patients start on nivolumab for cycle one, and then abrutinib is added. And we see that amongst the Richter's patients, there are three responders, including two complete remissions for the Richter's with partial responses for the CLL in pretreated and high-risk patients. This is an example, a 66-year-old with P53 mutated disease, heavily pretreated, with a nice response at one month of therapy. This regimen's also been reported by Anis Yunus, 20 patients with Richter's with a 60% response rate, although only one CR. And of course, unfortunately, in this disease, PRs are not durable. Recently at Lugano, Anthony Mato updated the study of pembrolizumab with umbralisib with ublituximab. I'll just remind you, umbralisib is an investigational PI3 kinase inhibitor, which is thought to have a better safety profile than the prior generation PI3 kinase inhibitors. And ublituximab is an investigational anti-CD20 antibody that's often being paired with it in this U2 combination for drug development. 
So you can see the schema here. Pembrolizumab map early on with continuous umbralisib and ublimtuximab is ongoing, including a maintenance phase. And this study also enrolled a relapsed CLL cohort, but again, these are data just on the Richter's cohort. There were eight evaluable patients at the time. Seven of eight were BTK refractory. Response rate was 38% with two complete remissions. But there was actually some durability. This particular patient, 73 years old with 17 P deletion with six prior therapies, including CAR T cells, did achieve a CR which was sustained for 12 months, which is encouraging. So checkpoint inhibitors are definitely of interest in this disease. Another treatment option of great interest in this disease, we just heard from Tom Kipps a very nice talk about CAR T cells. And some ambiguity about their role in CLL primarily, but in Richter's transformation, where again the problem is getting a sustained remission to take the patient to transplant, which is our goal, CAR T cells, we can treat the patients when they're not in remission, and so there's potentially a lot of hope for using this therapy in this disease. And so amongst five patients treated after prior abrutinib, there were two complete remissions and one partial remission reported with one durable responder. And so this, there is additional data being acquired on this approach. And there's also a case report of blinitumumab in a Richter's patient. So where are we with Richter's? Well, clonally related Richter's differs biologically from de novo diffuse large B cell lymphoma and remains quite therapy resistant. It's associated with high risk CLL biology, particularly TP53 mutation or deletion and NOTCH1 mutation, as well as stereotype subset 8, which is that 4-39 gene. Obviously, we suspect Richter's in patients with new onset B symptoms or rapidly progressive lymphadenopathy and use PET scans to guide biopsy. There's unfortunately no consensus on therapy because really no therapy is very effective. And long-term survival has been mostly limited to those who undergo stem cell transplantation, but getting patients to transplantation has been limited by the inability to sustain a response. And so this is a potential treatment algorithm that was compiled by Wei Ding for our ASH education session last year based on a survey of a number of academic centers as well as the literature. So starting at the top, you identify a patient with Richter's transformation. Ideally, you would test for clonality of the transformation versus the CLL. In practice, that's very hard to do. There are not CLIA-approved clinical tests to test nodal biopsies for their immunoglobulin and gene rearrangement by and large. But if you were to identify that it was clonally unrelated, you would treat it as a de novo DLBCL. Failing that, everyone else, it it's nice if there's a clinical trial available, but often there isn't because there's not a large pool of patients. And so then we divided the remaining group patients into a couple of categories. So on the right, patients with CLL who are therapy naive, we saw they had a better survival curve with standard therapy. So we generally treat those as de novo DLBCL. In the middle, we have the patients on whom we have the most data who develop Richter's after chemoimmunotherapy. And there's evidence that deletion 17P or P53 mutation or complex karyotype are associated with worse outcome and chemo refractoriness in those patients. So in the absence of those events, it's certainly reasonable to treat them as DLBCL. In the presence of those events, it's somewhat controversial. If you have a young fit patient, probably still reasonable to give them a try at DLBCL therapy, but most of these patients don't have a durable remission. And so either initially with that identification or upon relapse, we triage them over to the group on the left, who are the patients who progressed on prior kinase inhibitors in particular, where we've seen that their outcomes are very poor. The patients who develop Richter's on venetoclax, there's been some suggestion that some of those patients may be able to be managed a little bit more easily like the post-CIT patients. And so we had suggested that maybe we would view them as the post-CIT patients, look at their biological features in deciding how to treat them. But the post-kinase inhibitor patients we've generally seen are always behaving badly. There's no known effective standard of care. And so options include the checkpoint inhibitors, different kinase inhibitor, adding a BCL2 inhibitor or using a BCL2 inhibitor alone. I often use high-dose steroid regimens in combination for some of these patients, but it's a very difficult situation. Obviously, if there's a clinical trial of a novel mechanism, that would be great to get these patients on. And so if they remain with refractory disease or relapse, we try for a CAR-T trial. But if you can get them into any type of remission that's sustained, then aim for a transplant. Thank you.